Okay. Um, what was reverberating you? Sorry. Okay, welcome everybody to <clears throat> this special meeting of Cabinet, Euro T Penalta, and available via Microsoft Teams here on Wednesday, the 17th of July, 2024. <clears throat> uh, members of the public um, or press may attend in person at Penalta House or may view the meeting via the, the, the link on the website. This meeting will be live streamed and a recording made available to view by the council's website except for discussions involving confidential or exempt items therefore the images or audio of those individuals present and or speaking will be publicly available to all via the recording on the council website apologies for absence councillor stenner and councillor elaine forehead and Councillor Andrews has had to be called to another meeting. And Christina Harry. And Christina Harry. No more. Um, declarations of interest. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and or prejudicial interest in respect of any item of business on the agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000, Council's Constitution and the Code of Conduct for both councillors and officers. Any declarations of interest on any item? Uh, agenda item three, the Welsh Government Leasing Scheme. And if I could ask Councillor Shane Cook to introduce this item. Yeah, thank you, Leader. The purpose of, the, of this report is to inform members of a change of approach with regards to leasing scheme Wales, following a request from Welsh Government for those local authorities who have not yet adopted the scheme. Leasing scheme Wales has been around since 2019, when Welsh Government asked local authorities to express an interest in adopting a pilot lease scheme to ensure that all local authorities have access to private sector accommodation to discharge their statutory duty. However, CCBC at the time made the decision not to express an interest in the pilot due to the local authority having its own private sector scheme under the umbrella of Caffili Keys. However, this is now, it is now an appetite from some private landlords within the borough for a lease arrangement that would allow the council to expand its access to the private sector market. The launch of the empty home strategy and team would mean that the grant aspect of the leasing scheme Wales model may assist and support bringing some empty properties back into use. The implementation of Rent and Homes Act has led to smaller landlords to look at other options for lease management functions, but not essentially want to pay estate agent fees. Given these changes, the Leasing Scheme Wales model would allow CCBC to provide private sector landlords another route to let their properties, whilst providing the Housing Solutions team greater access to affordable housing to support discharging of the homeless duty. If the council were to agree to adopt and deliver the scheme, then the Housing Solutions Service would manage the lease scheme alongside Caffili Keys. Therefore, Leader, I'm happy to move the recommendation set out at 3.1 and 3.2. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Do we have a seconder for the report? Councillor Chris Morgan. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to uh, second this report. Is it okay if I uh, follow on with the question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, have we got sufficient staff to survey all these properties, please? We've got Nick and Kerry. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Morgan. Um, <clears throat> We anticipate that this scheme um, will um, generate a level of interest, because that's why we want to take on the scheme, but not a significant amount of interest in the early um, uh, start of the programme. So we have made the decision um, within the team that the initial um, uh, assessment of the properties are taken um, in-house and dealt with by um, environmental health team in the private sector housing team, and they'll be doing that in-house for us. And, in terms of surveying the properties to see the, ex the extent that, of works that may be needed um, uh, to, uh, to, to bring this, the properties into the scheme in line with the criteria. If that then changes and if the scheme does generate more interest, which we hope, then we'll review that as we go. Um, for, but from a, from a surveying perspective, we're dealing with that uh, in-house. You would have noticed within the paper also, there is um, a, a sum of money that is made available for all those that enter the leasing scheme, which is 36,000, and we'll be um, uh, utilising that as we go through the course of the scheme to um, be able to manage it appropriately. 
Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. That financial support um, comes from Welsh Government? Yeah, so part of the package comes one of the attractions of um, taking the scheme forward. So all the existing local authorities taken on have had the benefit of that um, support from Welsh Government. Okay, thanks, Nick. Any future further? Uh, Philippa, uh, Councillor Leonard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I ask, what is the minimum mandatory standard for a property to be brought back into the scheme, please? Thanks, Councillor Leonard. Um, uh, as these are private um, properties of private private landlords, um, will be taking on the, the management under the lease, but they need to be brought up to HHSRS, which is the, I get, forget this the acronym wrong, so I read it, um, Housing Health and Safety Rating System. So they have to be brought up to that standard. There's obviously incentives within the programme to bring the properties up to um, Energy Performance Certificate C, which is about SAP 70, up to, to SAP 70 score, if you know it as SAP. Um, they get a five thousand um, pound grant to bring that property up to um, that that standard, um, uh, and and that is that is managed within uh, the scheme. So it's up to HHSRS standards with um, an additional incentive to get the energy performance up as well. Okay, any Jamie uh, Councillor Butcher? Yeah, thanks, Leader. So. Would this scheme act as a um, resource for local authority homelessness teams seeking to move home households on from temporary accommodation? Thank you, Councillor Pritchard. Yes, this will provide much needed access into the private rented area for us to discharge our statutory functions for homeless households, both in temporary accommodation, but also where we're holding individuals under the current prevention agenda. It will allow us to really tackle the current crisis that we have, not only with our own social housing stock, but the affordability and rent levels within the private rented market across the borough. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, Councillor Shankock. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Uh, would this leasing scheme have an impact on the number of empty properties we have in the borough? Thank you, Councillor Cook. That is our intention. We are working closely with the empty properties team. I've already met with the private sector housing manager with regards to how we will be going out and engaging with the individuals who are either inheriting or currently own existing empty properties. And this will be an offer as part of that empty homes package going forward, should it be agreed today that we can take this forward. There is an additional incentive within the Leasing Scheme Wales paperwork where we can offer empty property landlords an additional grant on top of the 5,000 of 9,999 pounds that they can use for renovation works to allow us to bring that property into use. So we see that as an added incentive in order to tackle some of the empty property challenges within the borough at the moment. Okay. Thank you. That, that really is good news. I mean, we've got to use every tool in the box, I suppose, at the moment with the the housing crisis. I know the Caffili Keys has been very successful. Um, we're, we're in in partnership with private landlords, and this is just um, uh, another tool to be added to that box. So um, I can't see anybody else indicating. So with that, I think if we can go to the vote on the recommendations, uh, Rob. Thank you, Leader. Uh, members, if you could please cast a vote on the poll that's going to appear before you any moment. Any problems anyone's having, please let me know. And Leader, the recommendations within the report are unanimously approved. Thank you. OK, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Kerry and Nick. With that, we'll move to Agenda item four, <clears throat> which is the um, annual corporate safeguarding uh, report, which I understand went through um, scrutiny last evening. If I could ask Councillor Shanecock to introduce this. Yeah, thank you, uh, Leader. On behalf of the Chair of the Corporate Safeguarding Board, I'm pleased to present the Board's annual corporate safeguarding report, the forward work programme and the key safeguarding activity data for 2023-24 for your consideration and comment today. Cabinet is fully aware that safeguarding is everybody's business and the Social Services and Wellbeing Act introduced a statutory duty to report, making it an offence to fail to act on any safeguarding concerns. We all have responsibility to ensure we understand how to respond to such concerns if they arise. Cabinet is reminded that all of the board is responsible for ensuring appropriate governance arrangements are in place to assure the council that the safeguarding policies and procedures across all services areas are effective. 
I can confirm the annual reports were approved by the Corporate Safeguarding Board on the 3rd of May and were presented to the Social Services Scrutiny Committee for information yesterday. Taken together, the reports provide a strategic overview of corporate safeguarding activity during the year, identifying progress made and areas for further development during 2024-25. Cabot is requested to note the content of the three reports and the progress made in implementing the forward work programme. Thank you, Leader. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cook. Uh, do we have a second for the report? Councillor Nigel George. Thank you, Leader. Yes, I'm happy to second the report. Okay, thank you. Well, that the debate is in order. Um, do we have any questions on this? Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Leader. <clears throat> As safeguarding is everybody's business, can officers please explain how partnership working within and outside the council is key to ensuring there's a robust approach to safeguarding? Go. Gareth and Nicola, you understand? Yep, Nicola Barrett, who's the safeguarding lead across adults and children's services and also the corporate safeguarding lead for the for the local authority. So okay. any difficult questions, Nicola will be able to answer. <laughs> um, but, but I'll kick off. I mean, partnership working is a fundamental element, uh, a fundamental basis upon which all safeguarding is is based. So all of our procedures, all of our practice, is based on good partnership working and that is just as important internally as it is externally. So internally you won't be surprised that education and social services are the lead uh, service areas for safeguarding and there's daily contact uh, across those two service areas. A uh, lot of information exchange between the safeguarding leads, we've got dedicated leads within education, dedicated leads within within children's services uh, to, to ensure that that is effective. Across other service areas, we've got the designated safeguarding officers, the DSOs, in each service area, and they have direct access to Nicola for advice uh, and to Nicola's team, um, but also directly into IAA, the Information Advice and Assistance Service. So if they've got any doubts, any queries, any advice that they require, they've got constant access to, to support if they need it, and that is really effective. Um, Externally, of course, our key partners are the police and we co-host, no, we don't co-host, we actually host the West Safeguarding Hub. So the police team for the covering the West of Gwent, uh, located currently in Foxes Lane due to move to Woodfield side, co-located with us. So that information exchange, the ability to share information, the ability to make decisions immediately as things are coming in in live time is, is critical to that. But of course, we've got the, the Regional Safeguarding Board, which brings all of that together, and, and we're key players within that. Uh, I'm co-chair of, of the, the Safeguarding Board. That covers adults and children's. Nicola is chair of the Business Planning Group, which is the engine room, if you like, of, of the board. So everything everything is coming through that, and that means that we we stay abreast of, of everything that, that we need to do in, in terms of responding to national changes and local changes, regional changes. Um, as I say, there's a uh, there's an awful lot of information in the reports, but but if there are any questions, then then between us, we'll be able to to answer them in, in greater detail. Okay, thank you, Gareth. Councillor Nigel George. Thank you, Leader. Uh, it's noted in the report that there is good progress in the safe recruitment retraining packages supported via people services. When will the t training take place, please? Thank you, Councillor George. Really good. Question. Um, yes, we've got 100% compliance with safe recruitment, um, but that is that is down to HR supporting recruiting managers as, as at the moment. And our plan is to roll that uh, a formalised training programme out to all officers who are involved in recruitment. And we're reliably informed by uh, by HR that that is an email is going to go out to all managers next week. Uh, if not next week, it'll certainly be the week after. So that will that will both publicise the training and ensure that that it's mandatory for everyone to to actually complete. Okay, thank you, Gareth. Um, and so it should be mandatory, as you say. Safeguarding is is everybody's issue. It's good to know that you're working on this uh, on on a regional basis. The Gwent footprint. Um, of course. Problems and issues, no, no, no borders or boundaries. How does the Gwent footprint um, and the Gwent police work hand in hand with uh, the rest of the South Wales region? Because you know we're often in situations where 
children live in one area but go to school in another area or vice you know vice versa so is it a communication cross border there's, there certainly is and, and Nicola will be able to give you operational um, experience of that but if I just talk strategically for a minute we we all of our safeguarding um, boards have business managers those managers meet nationally so there's a regular opportunity and those meetings are held with Welsh government so there's there's an opportunity to to share themes and issues that are emerging there um, but equally there's a national safeguard independent safeguarding board for Wales. So we've got a relationship there as well. They they pick up themes that they that they share learning then across the regions. But operationally, I don't know, Nick, is there in terms of managing IAA and how we manage transfers in and out of the county, it, it's effective, isn't it? It is certainly effective. We follow the wheel safeguarding procedures and we communicate regularly with local authorities in um the South Wales area and then with regards to South Wales police as and when needed on particular on specific cases yes so there are a lot of procedures in place that we follow particularly from an IAA perspective and strategy discussions where safeguarding decisions are needed in respect of children and adults and and just to add to that understandably but just in our loca our location ourselves we've got family members living in the other neighboring authorities so if if there are issues with children and children have to be placed with extended family that often means that it's it's in our neighboring authority so some Newport children are placed in Caffili with extended family, vice versa. So it's it's really important that you've got that ongoing dialogue with with each other in order to to simplify those processes wherever we possibly can. And I suppose the the ultimate question is: Are these safeguarding procedures working um, for the vulnerable people that, that you know are, um, for residents out there? Uh, is there evidence of, of stopping something early before it be, goes on to become a bigger problem? That, that, that's a really difficult one, isn't it? Because we don't know what we don't know. That's right. um, we're, we're very confident that all of our prevention services identify problems early on and the support that we provide, we think uh, we're confident, divert families out of those statutory processes by providing that family support. But equally, we have families presented to us where they are either in crisis or something has happened to a child that we've had no involvement with that we have to respond to. So we, you almost have the two ends of the spectrum, if you like. We've got the the families that that are that have some low level concerns and we're able to support, mm. and we've got families at the at the top end where you may have babies being injured, um, and we have to intervene immediately. What we don't know is 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 the other portion of society and, and we, we have to rely on other professionals and that's where the duty to report is really important. It's where people under professionals understanding their their safeguarding responsibilities is critical because we have to rely on health visitors. We have to rely on on teaching staff to identify those those issues for us so that we can get in and, and support them earlier if possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Gareth. Any further questions? Um, Cabinet is asked to note the, the report, so if we can go to the vote on that, Rob. Yes, certainly, Leader. Members, uh, please, could you vote on the poll that's before you? And, Leader, the recommendation is unanimously approved. OK, Thanks. thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item five is the provisional revenue budget outturned for 2023. Councillor Philip Leonard. Thank you, Chief. The purpose of this report is to provide Cabinet with details of the provisional revenue budget outturn for the 2023-24 financial year and to seek Cabinet endorsement of proposals for the use of surplus general fund balances prior to the consideration by Council on the 24th of July. Appendix A of the report summarises the outturn position, which is a net overall underspend of 8,834,000, including schools and the housing revenue account. The 23-24 outturn position will result in the 13 million 
546,000 being transferred into general fund balances and the 1,313,000 into the HRA working balances reserve. However, 6 million Point six point zero zero million will be drawn down from the school balances to cover the school's overspend and 18,000 will be drawn down from the winter maintenance reserve to cover the in-year overspend on this budget. The 13,546 transfer into general fund balances is an increase of 8,648,000 on the assumed transfer on the assumed transfer of 4,898,000 as at period nine. Whilst this increase is one-off additional funding is welcomed, it needs to be considered in the wider context of the extremely challenging financial position facing the council. Furthermore, some of the 23-24 underspends have already been included as savings in the 24-25 approved budget. However, the increase in the level of underspend will be reviewed in detail to determine if further savings can be identified to support the budget settings process moving forward. The positive outturn position is in part due to mobilising Team Caffili transport projects that have focused on improved financial management and spend control. There has also been a strong focus on vacancy management throughout the 23-24 and increased visibility, scrutiny and accountability of third-party spend. These measures have resulted in more robust budget management and reduced spend and are promoting a culture of strong financial management to support the challenges that lie ahead. The school's in-year overspend is ring-fenced. Consequently, school balances have reduced from 11 Point three million to 5.3 million as at the 31st of March 24. At the end of the 22-23 financial year, there were five primary schools with a collective deficit of 151,000 and three secondary schools with a collective deficit of 949,000. As at the 31st of March 24, there are 15 primary schools with a collective deficit of 559,000 and six, six secondary schools with a collective deficit of 2.9 million. This will need to be kept under close review during the 24-25 financial year, with the number of schools setting deficit budgets will be underpinned by recovery plans. The table in Appendix B of the report shows the movements on the general fund balance from the 1st of April 23 to the 31st of March 24, along with the agreed commitments for 24-25 and an assumed contribution of 1.050 million to support the revenue budget for 25-26. There is currently a projected balance of 21,722,000 on the general fund and Cabinet will recall that it is usually recommended by the Section 151 officer that the minimum balance should be 3% of the Council's net revenue budget, which equates to £13,476,000 for the 24-25 financial year. This means that there is a projected surplus general fund balance of £8,246,000 and proposals for the use of this surplus balance are set out in the paragraphs 5.10.3 and 5.10.15 of the report. Cabinet will note that the most significant proposal is the establishment of an MTFP contingency fund of 5,266,000 to support delivery of the significant saving requirement of 45,213,000 facing the Council for two-year period 25-26-26-27. It is important that robust saving proposals are developed at pace and with this in mind it is also proposed the delegated authority on the drawdown of funds from the MTFP contingency fund should be granted to the chief executive in consultation with a leader, relevant cabinet member and the section 151 officer. I'm happy to move the recommendations as detailed in paragraphs 3.1.1 to 3.1.4 of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leonard. Uh, do we have a second there? Councillor Jamie Pritchard. Yes, thank you, Leader. Can I second the report, please? Thank you. With that, the debate is uh, in place. Anybody have any questions? So, so Councillor Philippa Leonard. Yeah, thank you. 
How can you can you tell me how are we supporting schools to manage their budgets, please? We got Steve Harris and Leanne. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, we have a finance team which is dedicated to working with the schools, uh, so we do work with them on a daily basis. Uh, I think importantly, where schools are looking at potential deficits, that support will be more intense. We do also agree recovery plans with the schools, which are monitored closely, uh, and we do give them a period of up to three years to turn that position around. So we do we do keep that in a close review. There are capacity issues within the education finance team, but you'll note in the report as well that we are seeking some temporary resource within finance two posts uh, because we anticipate obviously with the reducing balances uh, on the school funds uh, and the financial challenges that we're facing moving forward that the level of support required is likely to be more thanks steve that's that's good to know because obviously um to try and make those savings and make sure that the, the schools remain uh sustainable that they will need that 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 support any further questions? Councillor Chris Morgan. Thanks, Leader. Um, how much of this underspend is actually attributable to the Mobilising Team Gifferley project? And is there a figure that can be carried forward as a permanent saving? Thank you. It's difficult to put um, a firm number on it, um, but it's clear um, that obviously there is a bit, bit of a cultural shift in the organisation. Uh, through the messaging that's coming through mobilising team to Philly, uh, particularly through the uh, improving financial management work stream at the present time. It alludes in the report to the fact there's now a more robust challenge uh, on vacancies across the organisation, third party spend. We're putting spend control measures in place, which are also having an impact. So whilst it's difficult to put an actual number on it, I think there's enough evidence to suggest that it is having a positive impact. Um, but what we will be doing, a uh, cabinet member, uh, it says in the report, we will be doing a deep dive into all of the underspends to actually establish if some of those can be taken as recurring savings moving forward. And clearly, where that is the case, we will present those pro uh, proposals as part of the next budget round. OK, thanks, Steve. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Shankock. Yeah, thank you, Leader. <clears throat> Within Children's Services, there's been an overspend of 1.6 million. Can officers please provide some detail on the cost pressures within children's services and how we plan to mitigate these cost pressures moving forward? Gareth. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Councillor Cook. The, the overspend, uh, as the report says, the, the overspend relates solely to increased complexity and challenges of children, um, particularly children who become looked after, and the costs of their care increasing, um, you know, phenomenally in some in some cases. We're not alone in terms of that. That is a national position. Um, and you'll also see within within the report that those that, that overspend was actually um, offset by underspends across other parts of the service area. Um, so, so overall, the over the overspend wasn't 1.6; it was 850,000. Um, however, that doesn't that that just masks the underlying problem, doesn't it? That that children are being presented to us with increased complexity, increased challenges, and the cost of that care is is rising. What we're doing to try and mitigate against that, as as cabinet will be aware, is we've got expansion plans for our in-house residential care. Not necessarily to make significant savings, but we know the quality of that care is is better, and therefore the escalation of children through the through the system bouncing around into higher and higher cost placements, we should be able to impact. We're continually re trying to recruit foster carers and anything that that you can do in in your constituencies and across the across the council to en encourage that, then then that would be gratefully received. And we are working really hard. Um, to move children out of care and into extended family placements wherever that's safe to do so, that comes with a cost. But it's not what what we're then what we then able to release is the social work time and, mm. and the the indiv in, the independent reviewing officer time if if children are not in care but still being supported by us. So there are a range of things that we're trying to do to to mitigate against that. But the reality is our overall numbers haven't changed significantly. Our looked after population is is relatively stable and is actually reducing year on year. Uh, our children on the child protection register is stable and has reduced, um, but is now stable. 
so and the overall number of families that we're supporting hasn't changed but the costs of that support is where the changes have have, have occurred okay thanks gareth um as you say it's not just about the cost it's about the outcome for these children and you do hear horror stories of children almost being treated as commodities in the private sector where they um being bounced from one home to another and each time there's an increased cost increased package and and it sometimes feels like the public sector is just doing everything it can to to uh, take money out of the public purse with more emphasis on profit than actual outcomes that's what it feels like yeah to- totally agree and i think it's a good opportunity for us to to offer some assurance about how we work in kafili You'll remember, uh, for some members will remember, we had the highest cost placement in the world at the time, uh, about five years ago, £16,000 a week. But we were commended in court for the package of support that we put around that placement. Um, that's been surpassed now. We, I've got, I've got neighbouring authorities paying £25,000 a week. Um, we are nowhere in that region. The highest our cost is is, is around eight thousand, which which is becoming fairly standard. So so we're okay with with what we're doing. But it's important to just acknowledge that where we do need to do that, the the support that that we put around the child doesn't change irrespective of where they're placed. Yeah, yeah, and and you know while there is a cost, as you say, to children coming out of the the um being looked after and, and going into the in, in, with family members the outcomes there are, um are often better yeah absolutely we, we know ir- irrespective of a child's care experience we know that they will end up returning to family members whether that's with our support before they're 18 or without our support after 18, if that yeah. if that makes sense. So it's important we're, we're putting a lot of emphasis within our 16 plus service on on navigating safe pathways back into family um, placements because we know it's where, where children do best. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks Gareth. I realize um, I'm making a, a terrible mistake as a chair year and it's so easy to do on a report that covers everything the council does is that you can go down there down, down rabbit holes, but it is so interesting and absolutely so important. Have we got any further questions on the outturn report? Um, the one for me, the, I mean, quite a shocking uh, overspend is 1.4 million on the home to school transport. Um, home to school transport is, is already quite a significant chunk of the education budget. Um, nine nine and a half million, I think, round figures, and 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 it's gone up to over eleven million with, with the overspend. Um, are we going to have to write increased costs into the next medium term financial plan, or um, are are there any other reasons for, for that overspend? Is it just an inflationary thing? No, neither. It's down to increased demand on the service, particularly with um, pupils with additional learning needs. Um, but as you'll be aware, uh, this is one of the work streams under mobilising Team Caffili. Uh, we're looking at the assessment criteria, obviously, for the provision of transport moving forward. Uh, and we'll also be looking um, at statutory distances at one point in the future as well. So my hope as the 151 officer is that the overspend is brought back under control uh, through the first part of that work. But secondly, uh, the statutory distances may also afford an opportunity for a saving moving forward uh, to help us address the 45 million gap that we're facing. Okay, Th- thanks, Steve. Thank you for that. Any further questions? No, with that, we'll move to the recommendations, please, Rob. Uh, certainly, Leader. There are four recommendations in the report, members. If you could please cast your vote on those recommendations in the poll that's before you. And leader, those recommendations are unanimously approved. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, agenda item six is the proposed increased charges for Kenlin stray dogs. I could ask uh, Councillor Philippa Leonard to introduce the report. Thank you, leader. The council has a statutory responsibility in relation to stray dogs. Stray dogs that are picked up and are microchipped or have a collar with a tag 
are returned to their owners with a warning. Dogs that are not identified are taken to third-party kennels where they are detained for a seven-day period prescribed in the legislation or until their owners reclaim them. It is a legal requirement for all dogs to be microchipped with correct details and every dog that is picked up by a dog warden is scanned for a microchip. The cost of kenneling and caring for detain, detained stray dogs are charged to the council and owners who reclaim their dogs are currently charged a fee to meet some of those costs. The council's kenneling contract has recently been retendered, resulting in an increase in cost to the council. And consequently, it has become necessary to review the fee charges to owners reclaiming their dogs. A new daily charge plus a release fee is proposed, with a discount being applied to the release fee for dogs that are microchipped in order to incentivise this. Cabinet are asked to approve the new fees for reclaiming dogs together with the proposed discount for correctly microchipped dogs. If approved, we plan to undertake a publicity campaign regarding microchipping as another reminder about responsible dog ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leonard. And uh, do we have a second there? Councillor Nigel George. Thank you, Leader. Yes, I'll be the second report. Okay, with that, we'll move to questions. Does anybody have a question on this comes to chris morgan thanks yeah just a inquiry really how many dogs do we actually pick up in a year and uh, actually look after on average thank you uh, hi councillor last year was about 81 i believe that came in standard actual service requests um for last year for stray dogs with around 200 um we do try and return to owners. We scan them straight off. So hopefully a lot don't go to the kennels. And also social media is having a big impact on returning dogs to owners. So it has dropped. So the actual amount of dogs we do take to the kennels. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Um, come to Philip Leonard. Yeah, thanks. If um, if a dog has been in a kennel for a week, there's a substantial cost to that, I suppose, at the end of the week. So do we have any aid in place or any um, any way to pay off bit by bit for a fine if families are struggling to cover the cost? And if not, what happens to the dog? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So we're not proposing um, any discount or any sort of means tested approach. Um, it, it's quite difficult on the basis that if we release a dog for um, uh, to an owner from the kennels and uh, and then they subsequently don't pay, you know, we've given them sort of a period to pay and they subsequently um, don't pay, uh, then obviously that's a, another cost that, that falls back on us. Um, dogs that uh, are ultimately not reclaimed, then we pass them on to rehoming charities, so the dogs are, are rehomed. It would only be in a very small number of cases where the dogs, uh, either because of their you know, um, uh, condition health or because of their behaviour, are unsuitable for rehoming, that dogs would be euthanised. And again, that would be a cost that uh, that falls back to us. I guess the point to emphasise, you know, just thinking about where your question comes from, is that... Um, Actually, the dogs we pick up is, is detailed in the report, but the dogs we, we pick up only about a quarter are reclaimed. Um, it is an offence if your dog is not microchipped. Um, so people that are not microchipping their dogs and allowing their dogs to stray uh, are committing an offence. As, as Gary has indicated, the first thing that we do when we pick up a dog is use our best endeavours to return the dog to, uh, to an owner. So mm. you know, responsible dog owners uh, won't, have, won't have to pay and we'll get their dog back. There is quite a responsibility to having a dog. We uh, will be unveiling a plaque on um, a week on Friday, I believe, uh, which is about the lead initiative where we've had people and um, horrendous dog attacks. You get people who um, leave their dogs foul uh, uh, and don't pick it up or, or pick it up and throw the bags into trees. People, uh, you know, I mean, you just got to understand that it is a... Uh, um, a big responsibility to 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 own a dog and, and to to treat them properly. Um, does this make the will this make service cost neutral? 
so thank you, Leader. No, it won't make the service co cost neutral. Um, so we do have a statutory responsibility, as we've indicated, in respect of stray dogs. So there is a budget to deliver that statutory duty. Um, what this allows us to do is to meet some of those costs, but uh, it won't make this won't make the service um, cost neutral. Um, and you know, and, and a simple reason being is is that quite a number of dogs, uh, as is indicated in the report, it's actually a minority of dogs that we kennel the reclaimed. So a majority um, are retained by the kennels for at least seven days, and then are, and then are rehomed. And we obviously have to incur all, all of those costs. So we're not in a position where we would be able um, reasonably to charge owners who reclaim their dogs the costs of uh, dogs that are not not reclaimed. No. Um, and of course, we also have staff um, uh, employed, as is detailed in the report, employed uh, to to actually you know, respond to inquiries and complaints and concerns about stray dogs. Um, so we're not recovering those costs either. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rob. Good to know that the dogs do get. There is an attempt to to rehome the, the the dogs that don't, don't get collected. Um, with no further questions, uh, Rob, if we could move to the um, recommendations. Yes, leader members, uh, please could you vote on the three recommendations within the report? Many thanks. The recommendations are approved, Leader. Thank you. OK, thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, agenda item seven and eight um, are public interest tests. Um, would it be useful to take these both together or would they need separate votes? Yes. We'll do one. Yes, we'll do them separately. Separately. Yeah. Okay. If you could just give us an explanation of the public interest test. Certainly, leader. I'll explain them uh, both, and then we can uh, we can go into into the votes. So the um, the first um, public interest test um, certificate that I've done is for the report that you'll receive on Cumcarn Forest Drive. Um, this report uh, is looking at the uh, the future of uh, of that venue, and at this stage, I think it's fair to say that a number of options um, are being considered, and therefore my recommendation is that you exempt the press and public whilst you uh, consider uh, this report. Um, so that's that's the that's the the certificate uh, for the Cumcarn Forest Drive, and then the next certificate that I prepared concerns um, the purchase of a, a property at Risca, and as my um, report states, um, the, um, the the council uh, is interested in purchasing this property. Um, this report contains figures about what the council is prepared to offer for the property. Uh, clearly, um, this would be useful for rival bidders, the auctioneer, to know. So I'm proposing at this stage, again, that you consider the report um, in exempt session and exclude the press and public. Quite happy to take um, any questions from members on either of the certificates, um, but if there are no questions, um, we can go to the vote and we'll do that individually, please. OK, thank you, Rob. Nobody's indicating any questions on the pit. And um, do we have a mover? Councillor Jamie Pritchard. Yeah, thank you, Leader. I'm happy to move uh, both pit tests. Um, we'll have to do them individually. So okay. we'll do the Cumcarn one first. Happy to move uh, Cumcarn pit test. Thank you, Leader. Do we have a second for that? Councillor Nigel George. Yes, thank you, Leader. I'm happy to second it. OK, and do we have a mover for the um, acquisition of a property? Yes, Leader, I'm happy to move that. And do we have a second there? Yes, I'm happy to second the Leader. OK, thank you, Councillor Nigel George. Um, Therefore, Leader, we'll put the polls up before you now. Um, if members could cast their votes, that would be much appreciated. So the first one, is the pit for Kumkan.
and that is unanimously approved. And then we'll put the second vote up for the property in Risker. If you could vote on that one also. And that's been unanimously approved. So, Leader, um, you've voted as a cabinet to exclude the press and public. If you could just give us a few seconds and we'll close down um, the broadcasting and we'll consider the reports. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rob.